Thank you everyone for being here tonight. Wow, this has been a really exciting, bizarre, humbling few days of like never making art that other people see that I'm not performing, because um, I'm a performer, so I'm like reading you a poem, or I'm dancing around, or I'm taking my clothes off, and it's like, you know, we're having like, a relationship, and now I'm just like, there you are, just sitting in the chairs, looking at my stuff that I can't respond to you about, so it's, um, it's a new thing, newish thing, um, but um, the response has been really wonderful, so thank you. Um, so tonight is pretty, pretty chill. I would really love people to ask me questions. Um, I would love, ask me anything. I'm, I'll just tell, tell you if I don't want to answer. Um, if you've seen the work before, like in the past few days, and you want to ask questions, if you're seeing it for the first time, and you're like, what does that mean? Um, I thought I would start with a poem. Um, so for those that don't know, every uh, piece, it's a series, um, has a corresponding poem that goes with it. And um, I didn't get to read all of them on the, on the opening, but I would really like to share this one um, with you folks. So um, this poem corresponds with the piece in the middle, Pain Map, which is the uh, white background in uh, red stitching. When did the pain start? That depends on what you mean by when, and pain, and start. You see there, that sunken in part around my heart? That's the moat that, that developed around my ability to feel and give love. The water is mostly tears and it's full of scorpions. That fissure, after, like, like a fissure after an earthquake that formed right around when my mom died, but it didn't really start to fill up until later when I realized that she wouldn't be back. Now, if we're taking a wide when, I came into the world on the waves of a trauma, so not to mention all of the pain and heartache and ache and grief I carry in my marrow from my near and not so near ancestors. Oh, oh you mean the pain that can be diagnosed? Oh, when I was like 12 or 13. Juvenile fibromyalgia. Huh. Did I experience a trauma at that age? No. 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 Well, the summer before I turned 12, I did officially get a step monster, stepmother, and um, not just any stepmother, but the kind who validated every single fear that Disney movies had implanted me with. Cold. Cold. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> I can't handle that echo. <laughs> okay. Um, cold. Unkind. She didn't like kids. And the gaslighting. And the drinking. And the abuse. I cried throughout their entire wedding. It was my first time being a bridesmaid. My cousin. My cousin took me to see my then favorite musical, West Side Story, um, on the big stage. And I cried through all of that, too. It remains the consolation prize I won while they went on their honeymoon. So sometime after that, I started experiencing a searing pain in my back. It was really raw and splitting, and it would steal my breath. At this point, I already had generally uninvestigated chronic headaches and foot pain, so this was kind of the maraschino cherry atop my pubescent shit Sunday. But children don't get back pain. And you have those headaches because you read too much. You're just outgrowing your shoes, that's all. You're always crying for something anyway. All that swelling around my spine, that's from the impact of every time I was told I was somehow making it up or that it wasn't as painful as I described. Or do you mean the self-inflicted pain <laughs> that began as cutting and moved to piercings and finally tattoos? The pain that I made visible. The scars that remind me of the madness and the mire that I have made it through. The glimmer and shadow of bejeweled armor, gold, 
rhinestones, gems, bits and spits where punctures used to live that have served their purpose. The tattoos that steadily cover more and more of my body. The process of trembling under the needle for hours after hours. The ink and, and blood pooling together, working out how they're going to coexist. Those grotesque days of scabbing and gracious days of shedding. And once revealed, the healing now complete, there's only beauty left. Pain, detectable outwardly or otherwise, is the natural state of being for this, beauty, for this body. Does this hurt? That depends. Thank you. Does anyone want to ask me a question? I'm happy to talk until you think of some. So I thought I would share um, a little bit about where all the all these ideas came from. And I spoke a bit about, about it on the opening that um, I, I have a, we have a pretty good relationship, my muse and I now, um, when they were like, so you have this idea, it's gonna be five quilts. And I was like, I don't know, five quilts is kind of a lot. You sure one quilt? No, no. Mel, it's five quilts. Okay, okay, fine, I can do five quilts. Dear Tangled, can I please do five quilts? Sure. So then I was artist in residence <laughs> and it was great. Um, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, 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 I'm doing these five quilts. Yeah, 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 these five quilts. Next year, totally gonna happen, these five quilts. These five quilts, oh, I'm making five quilts. You're making five quilts, I'm making five quilts. It's totally gonna happen, it's totally gonna happen, I can do it. Hey Mel, yeah. So that third one, they're not actually gonna be a quilt. Can you like weave six different tapestries that kind of represent your ancestors? That's kind of a lot. I don't know if I can, if I can do six tap. No, no, it's gonna be this person and this person. And these. So these are tapestries, good? Okay, fine, fine. So Mel, Mel, yes. There's just this one more. You know that one you've been working on, the one by hand that's like your astrology quilt? Um, I know you weren't gonna finish it and include it in the exhibition, but could you just like wrap it up and like include it? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It's like, it's, it's all by hand. It's like, it's gonna take me a long time. No, but it's really important you got to Mel, Mel, do it. Ta-da! <laughs> so I feel like I had some choice, but not a ton of choice in, um, and kind of what you see here, but it didn't. It wasn't an ob you know. It wasn't like a rude obligation. It was like this process of two years, the past two years, of being in really close relationship to all of these ideas and all of these themes, and thinking about them constantly. Like I was thinking about fabric and patterns and textures and stitching, and like stitching positions and weaving positions and what kind of snacks to have at the studio and. Um, and all sorts of things over and over again. Um, and one of the biggest questions that I get is, like, how long did it take you to do stuff? Um, and it's a funny question because spoons and crip time and, like, time not really being the same for everybody. Like, I feel like I went to another dimension in order to complete all these things because I don't know where the hours came from. But for example, this piece, older still, took me about a year and a half um, because it's all by hand. And um, I'm really happy with how it turned out. It just took a really long time. Um, who knows about astrology? Come on, I know there's some homos in here that know about <laughs> astrology. So this is my birth chart. It's super personal if you're into astrology to look at it. If you're not into it, it's totally, you don't know what it means, but um, if you're an astrology person, this is very personal. <laughs> um, and so if you don't know, um, a natal chart is, um, everyone is so welcome because time is not linear, so please come and make yourself so comfortable. Um, so a, lin a, a natal chart is kind of a snapshot of the sky and all, where all the planets were and stuff the second that you were born. Um, and I've had a lot of lovely readings and stuff by people to learn a lot about how astrology has played out in my life and it's become a huge part of my spirituality. Um, hence why I wanted to share this piece with you. And um, I really like that it starts the show because 
we've just been together for like a really long time. Like we've traveled, we've flown places, like we've had to like undo stuff and go back together. I've had to like learn new skills to finish it. Um, overall, I'd say one of the most um, kind of like thrilling things that has come in, in the result of making all this work is all the skills that I got to learn. Um, so I learned how to do whole cloth quilting. I learned how to knit tapestries. Like a year ago, I didn't know how to knit. I didn't know how to weave a year ago. Um, and, now we, and I love doing it. Um, different things, different things that I've picked up that have really helped form how I, how I envision things. Um, and really, when I say like divine intervention, it was like things just, like that one was gonna be about anatomy. There was a map and it was anatomy. And that one was gonna be some kind of like planetary sunset sort of thing because it was in space. And it was in space from the second I Got the, got the thing. And that one was always going to be all black um, because all black everything. And <laughs> um, it's been super bizarre to sit here and be like they, look like, they look like how my mind made them. And it's like my hand did those, my hands did those things. I still don't make sense of that. I, I sewed all those things. I cannot comprehend it. Like when I was bringing them in, I was like, this is a lot of, it's a lot of stitching. And like all this. I was like, one by one, what? <laughs> like stitch by stitch. And it's just like, I've never done anything this big. I've never worked on anything this hard since I was like in school and working on like an essay about Shakespeare, because that's the kind of nerd that I was. Um, and it feels really amazing to be able to show and to talk to, which is why I want you to ask me questions, to talk to you about what it's like to be in this body making this work. Um, and there was a lot of times that were really, really, really hard because like my hands were cramping and like this one, this last mf -er, like we were like, you were so done. So I had the trim and we were going and it was like the last couple of days and my machine is like full and fuzzy and hot and I'm like, okay, we're doing this, it's happening. And then I did it and it was like, I don't like this. I'm gonna need to undo it and do it again. <laughs> And I said, really, Muse, because we're so, like, we're, like, last one, like, we're so close. And it was like, actually, no, I don't like it at all. You're going to have to do it again. So we did it again. <laughs> and um, it was like when I was kind of doing the zigzaggy parts, and my hands started cramping, but I was so close. And it was just this thing of, like, OK, listening to my body, but also deadlines, and also being sick, but also being, like, oh, like being accountable to other people. Um, and yeah, it was. It was just like a constant negotiation to be like, do I push myself or do I go home? Or like, am I gonna, what, what are the consequences of me asking this much of myself right now? Um, and the consequences are like a lot of pain and being really, really tired um, and eating weird things at weird times, like eating dinner at 10 p.m. a lot um, and like going to bed at 4 a.m. because I couldn't get out of that cycle for like a couple of weeks. Um, and yeah, and that's just like something I want to have conversation with and just be like, what, what does it mean for us to expect a thing from ourselves and fulfill that thing, even if it's really hard? Um, another piece that was really hard was the Black Matter Excellence. Um, I had the, um, so if you haven't looked at that piece, um, it's embroidered with names of people. Um, so, okay, backtrack. The pattern, the traditional quilt pattern is called flying geese. <laughs> um, and when I think about geese, and when I think about flocks, I think a lot about um, Adrian Mew Brown and emergence and um, dandelions and the ways that she talks about how, um, how a flock of birds can communicate with each other without communicating and how they know where they're gonna go, you know, because of trust and patterns and, um, energy vibrations, right? Um, and how that happens all the time, every year with so many different kinds of species that they find their ways, find, find ways to move together um, in pretty unique ways. Um, and I was thinking a lot about what it means to like join as black people with Black Lives Matter um, and try to like move towards this like thing of not being killed, of you know, not being hunted, um, and what that would be like to like move together and what it's like right now to move together across like many different countries and cities and communities um, just trying to like exist, like just trying to be free. Um, 
for so many years and how you know we're trying to like do this really we're just trying to like get past this kind of genocide um, and what happens is we're being killed right and so we're trying to like this and then people are like bringing us down and so I was like what what is it like when we keep losing the birds that we're in flock with um, and it sucks that's what it's like it sucks um, but as I read in the poem, and I can talk about it later, but um, alongside the experience of grief, of um, the particular kind of grief of being a black person right now, or for like the past 500 years, um, is alongside that is like all the, I mean, all the activism at its base, but like all the power that comes from trying to like make yourself matter. Um, and so how many years of like amazing like revolutionaries and leaders and people that like like holds so much power for people to keep going and like those aren't forgotten like they're not in isolation like I didn't learn about um, like I didn't learn about Trayvon without learning about other people I didn't learn about Mike Brown without learning about Black, Black Lives Matter and so it wasn't it's not um, for me part of what makes me be able to keep kind of flying up is like knowing that we are finding power and we are getting stronger, but there is just a lot of like people taking us out in our flock, right? Um, and yeah, and so that pattern, I really wanted to kind of mess with geese and mess with um, order um, and the kind of um, almost like routine complacency that comes when a lot of people are killed at once or in a lot of, in a row. Um, and when you're hearing the same story over and over again on the news, like what that does to various kinds of people and whether you ignore it or whether you see it and you're like, that hurts, oh well, or whether you see it and you're like, that hurts, I gotta go to bed for a few weeks, like, or whatever it is. Um, and the fact that it's like a ticker tape, um, just to, um, I wanted to kind of draw people closer to some of those names. Um, and for me, the names that I picked were folks that um, specifically affected me when they died, like the moments, I remember the moments of all those people um, when I learned about them. Um, and it was really, really, really hard to work on. Um, and it was the, like the names were the last thing I did. Like I had finished most of it for like months and months ago, but I was like, I couldn't, I couldn't write them on. I couldn't sew them on. I couldn't like, it was just, um, It was just really difficult. It was just really hard to like sit with these um, people that I really mourned, that I never knew, that I wanted to remember, but I never knew, right? Um, and sometimes it was a little bit easier. By the end, um, I had wanted to add people that had been, that were killed last week. Um, and I couldn't sell their names, and so I had really blessed, lovely, queer, brown, sewer community come and be like, oh, no, 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 this is not a job that a black person has to do right now. I'm going to take this and I'm going to sew until one in the morning so that you don't have to do these names. Um, and that was probably like the most blessed thing that happened. Like, it was really amazing. Um, and that person isn't here, so I'm not going to chat them out. But um, um, something I wanted to speak to that kind of relates to that is like how community like made this happen. Like, people fed me, people like fed my cats, um, people brought me snacks, people sent me texts, people sent me texts, people sent me so many texts that were like, I know, it's your last week, or like, here you go, and like, I'm really excited about this, and I was like, who are you, who are these people that are excited about the stuff that I'm making, I don't get it, but it really helped. <laughs> um, and, and every time I would, what kind of really kind of kicked me into an excitement gear was um, in October, um, or in the fall of last year, I did a, um, an event with another disabled artist, um, Ellery Russian, um, E.T. Russian at Unit 2, and we did kind of like a work in progress comics text, textile thing. Um, and the night before, um, we were like talking about what we were going to do and going over stuff, and my like 20 pound cat was like sitting on their lap, like being adorable, and they were just like shooting the shit and stuff. They're really into cats. They have two exceptional cats. I'm not going to talk about cats. <laughs> More than like a little bit. 
Um, and so I was just, I had planned to do one thing, um, like a few poems or whatever, and then I was just telling them about the exhibition, or the, the show, and I was like, oh yeah, and I'm like doing these X amount of pieces, and it's kind of like this, and I went through and I talked about um, each kind of piece in the series, like each kind of section in the series, and they were like, have you told anybody that? And I was like, no, just I'm kind of like working on it. Like I'll be done in like a year, it's fine. And they were like, I think you should, that was, like can you do that for your present? That was really cool, can you do that for your presentation? And I was like, but it's just like my work. They were like, no, 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 no. People wanna hear that stuff, like go. And so we, I totally redid a presentation and I made a PowerPoint in that night and then I was like, hey, people, this is this thing that I'm working on that's a work in progress and it's kind of like this and people were really into it. And come on in. Um, and, um, I have not had that experience before because like writing is so like, like, <laughs> and you know, that's great. Um, but it's not always super public um, and not always super like, hey, I just wrote a poem about these really awful hard things, wanna read it? <laughs> it's hard to do that, poets know. Um, but there was something about people being like, excited about the pace that I was going to do the things that I was going to do that was really, really validating um, and really su surprising because I feel like everything is just, we gotta go really fast and it's art and it has to happen quickly or you know, gotta let people know in these ways and um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even know how to qualify it by time but like so many of these pieces happened in the last like six weeks. Like that one took me a year and a half. That one I finished last year this one I finished like in the spring, but like these little tapestries were one night each or one day each. Um, the other thing about it is that a lot of it was um, improv. Um, all the weaving was improv and so I would, you know, watch some videos of like Audrey talking or I would like watch these really cool interviews with Octavia on Charlie Rose and she was like, no, that's not what I'm writing about, this is what I'm writing about. And like the really beautiful interviews with Basquiat and like talking about his art and stuff and I would sit with them and then I would weave for them and weave with them um, and this is what they wanted me to do so they just kind of happened um, but yeah like it took a long time but it was all up here like it was all the poems and all the layouts and all the feelings were up here and so it was just once I got my hands on the things it just kind of happened in a way I mean there was a lot of work but it did happen <laughs> um, I'm going to stop talking in case anyone wants to ask me anything. It's okay if you don't, but I would love it if you would. Hi. Hi. I'm Deirdre. Hi, Deirdre. How are you? Good. How are you? Yeah. I'm just to take off on these, um, this, these four hanging works, I'm just curious to hear you talk a little bit more about them. I, I find them very compelling and, and quite beautiful. But I'm Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you spoke about kind of the disorganized slide. Like, and so each piece, um, the, the, the people that I picked um, who spoke to me were, what kind of inspired the whole ancestor piece was the fact that I get to sit here and talk about being a crip artist and be like, this was really painful, that took me a really long time, or whatever and that you know that about me and that like I, I get to be really clear about this part of my existence as you learn about my, as you read my poetry, as you get involved with my art. And there are a lot of folks who came before me who didn't get to do that. Um, and so Audrey and June in particular both lived hell along with cancer in like a lot of 
pain. And you know, June talked about like she couldn't stop working. Um, she she couldn't she had to mark papers while she was like in cancer pain. And so um, the pieces are the the tools are partially what they used, and also um, almost like a a symbol of what they kind of had to like give up. Um, and we know about their illnesses and their um, and their complexities after they're, they've gone, right? Like we know now that Basquiat was in a, like he was in a really big car accident when he was younger, and it affected his body. Like it affected how his it affected his pain. Like it affected his whole system. But he didn't really get to talk. About, he was 27. Like he didn't get to talk about that because he was a prolific, like you know, like life-changing artist. And how do you in that moment talk about being? in really physical pain or not being able to do the exhibition with Andy Warhol because you feel really crazy when, um, when people are like, can I have more though? Can, like, can you make me more paintings? Can you make me more amazing, beautiful, inspiring art about your pain but don't tell me about your pain? Um, and so that's, that's kind of what I was really thinking about with these pieces. And um, Octavia like, you know, lived with like, mental complexities and um, was like, this amazing, hermit in, in how she lived and that affected how the things that she made in and affected, um, uh, it affected how she died. And um, I wanted to just have as much like brimming beautiful foliage because that's where she died. Like she died just like, you know, covered in, in trees and, you know, around her house where she had like made this like amazing nest. but like the result of being someone who needed a certain kind of isolation and the fact that people are like, okay, so you're kind of famous and you're kind of hermited, so I'm just gonna like peace out while you do your thing. I'm not gonna check in necessarily. Um, I'm, I'm maybe not gonna show up because maybe you don't need me to because you're famous and you live alone. Um, and um, I'm just gonna pause for one second. Um, and so it was really, um, it was very like, it was hard, but also really healing, yeah. healing to be able to like work on those pieces to get together with my ancestors. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ashley. So, yeah, so the question was if one of the tapestries symbolizes um, my mom more than one of the others. And, um, like, with doing the, doing the self-portraits, um, so something that's true is that I look a lot like my mom. Like, we kind of look like the same person. So much so that the portrait that I have on my arm when I'm, like, in places with, like, curious ways of understanding tattoos, people are like, did you get a portrait of yourself? And I'm like, I did. Yes, I got a massive portrait of my own face <laughs> on my body. <laughs> um, so anyway, and so <laughs> we've looked a lot alike for a long time. Um, and uh, about 10 years ago now, I got a massive surgery on my face, um, in my jaw, and um, it completely changed how I looked for like a year and a half. Um, and it fucked me up, like hardcore, because it was like, this is, no, this is the face that I, like, this is, this is what I get. Like, this is this face that I get. This is this body, like, the blood in my body is, like, what I get to be with her. I get to look at myself and see what she looked like. And then it was gone for, like, a while. Um, and kind of, I have a really different relationship to my face now. And, like, I'm not, I don't actually, like, see what people see, like, when I see pictures and stuff, because I still see where it was swollen. And I still see, like, like where it didn't move back or whatever. Um, and I had to do a lot of like reckoning around her memory and her face, <laughs> and I wasn't prepared to, 
do that at the time. Um, and so there was something about like, working on these portraits and being, um, I mean, it was, it was improv and it was, like, it was like the materials that I was working with were just kind of like these bits that I had connected or collected over years. Um, I would say like, especially with the self-portraits, like she's just like part of the, part of the wall, like, um, and particularly um, because I went away. This is such a like long, long game story, but I'm gonna try and like make it small. I went away and I didn't know I had some family and then I met some family and it turned out we all look alike and we all look like my mom. Um, and so I've had the last like few weeks of being like, of, it was only, it was just our faces, like it was just me and her that looked alike and had this kind of similar face stuff like for a long time and then now all, all of a sudden I have aunts and cousins and uncles and nieces and nephews and grandnephews that like share this face and um, that's just been like this really powerful like, like oh it's okay. I don't, I'm not the only one. I don't have to do all the job of like remembering what you look like or like it's not like it's not up to me being the kid that I am um, to carry all of the weight of her memory. Um, and so that's been really healing. But yeah, I'd say she's like in the fibers. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Mm. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about your muse? It, it, they sound very interesting. <laughs> and I would like to hear more about that. And also your cats. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I couldn't work at home because I have two cats that shed so much that when I was working on this one, like we had to like, I had to put full stop because I was like, I am weaving your entire body into <laughs> this piece and I would love to not do that. Um, <laughs> so that was definitely part of our relationship. The amount of like lint rolls that I've gone through just to like get these pieces not allergic to people when they get in here is like a whole thing. Um, so my muse, so a couple years ago I heard, um, I think it was, I want to say it was like a story about Tom Waits or something like that, that I heard on the radio and he was in a car, he was driving, and he got like an idea for a song, like right away, he didn't have anything to write it down and stuff, and he was like, listen, if you really want me to have this song, you're gonna give it to me when I can actually write it down and do something with it, otherwise you can give it to somebody else, but I cannot do anything with it right now, so we're gonna have to have a conversation about like timing. And I was like, you can talk back to them? Like, <laughs> <laughs> we can like have a conversation about like how you're gonna show up. Um, and so this whole, like the Muse thing has been like a huge exercise in trusting my intuition, which is really hard for me to do as like a trauma baby and like all the different things that I live with and like trusting that I make useful choices. Um, and so there was this freedom in being like, I did just like all five, the first five arrove, arrove, arrived, arrived, <laughs> English major. Um, arrived and, um, and I s didn't understand, like I was like, I didn't, I never, I've never really understood how my poems would just come out of me or how like whatever I would make would just like blah. And I'd be like, people would be like, oh, like, how'd you write this thing? And I was like, I actually just, it actually just did, like it just came out of me. Um, and it, when I was, um, I wanna say like nine, I wrote the first poem about my mom, like the first time I'd written about my mom dying was when I was about nine. Um, and I just was like, oh, and I wrote this poem and I was like, I'm nine, I'm gonna bring this to school and show my teacher. Um, and so I brought this like, you know, double Scorpio kid poem about like my mom dying to my teacher and she fucking lost it like in the class and she was like wailing in class and I was like, oh, I don't really know what to do with this at all. The reading is, that does it, like words do that to people? Like that's like really, I'm sorry, I had the hard thing and you're having like a really hard reaction to it and I'm a kid <laughs> and I don't really know what to do with your feelings. Um, but they've always kind of just like come through me and it's been a really hard thing to trust because um, for all sorts of reasons. And so in this, the past couple of years has been like, there wasn't ever, there was never like um, any doubt, I guess. 
and I have a lot of doubt in other things. And so there was never any doubt in what these were. And so that kind of gave me the time almost to be like, um, like just ask a lot of questions of like, okay, well, what if I don't do one? Like, because I would get card readings and stuff, and it'd be like, it's okay if you don't finish it. And I'd be like, okay, what, what if I don't do one? And then I would like sit on it, and I would just be like, no, it's these. These are the ones you're doing. Um, and I feel like it was this process of trusting that there's a, th that there's like, like a central something that I've wanted to communicate or that I've wanted to make or express or experience that all sorts of things and oppressions and stuff have like gone like this. And I feel like my muse was like, it's okay, come on, like, it's okay. And I'd be like, ooh, no, like, I'm just gonna like, maybe not do that. Or I don't think anyone's gonna wanna hear about that. I'm just gonna do one. And then like a few months later, I'd be like, here, a little bit more. And I'd be like, okay. <laughs> we're gonna do this, and it was just like, it was really like this, I feel like I can, we can talk about it, my muse now, because we've had this time of, of me being like, I don't know if I can do this, and then feeling what that was like, and then feeling like new kinds of inspiration, and like finding support in random, like, occurrences in life, and just trusting magic, yeah, trusting magic <laughs> is how I've kind of gotten to get to know my muse, which sounds really woo, but I think you might be into that, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Totally, thank you. Um, so kind of how the poetry and the te textiles work together. Um, so I've always said that I'm a poet first, like I, I was born a poet, um, and so everything that kind of comes out of my hands or my mouth ends up being somehow poetic. Like I wrote that and it was like, here's some paragraphs, these are paragraphs about art. And someone was like, that's a, that's a poem. And I was like, oh, cool, <laughs> I guess that's fine. <laughs> um, and so it was a, there was a trusting of that and there was like, okay, these poems want to be a part of these pieces and they wouldn't come. They would not come, they would not come. I would sit and I would try and I would get myself ready and I'd have my candle and I'd get my shit ready and I'd be like, okay, typewriter, let's do this. And they, they just wouldn't come, they didn't wanna come. Um, but I knew, oops, I knew, um, I knew that they lived with poems because of how I couldn't put all the words into stitches. Like they're very like, they go like this to me. Like it was like I couldn't find words for everything, so I stitched what I couldn't find words for, and then what their words, what, what words were there, I put them into poems. Um, and it was the same thing, like they were with me, I was writing them in my head for months, for a really long time, but they wouldn't write, they wouldn't come out. Um, and so again, I had to be like, okay, muse. Um, I don't know if I can do six poems on top of doing like six textile pieces. I don't know if I can do that. And then they were like, okay, like, or you could try haikus. And I was like, I could totally do haikus. And so I was like thinking about haikus for a, few, for a while. And then I just, that's not what started to be written. And I couldn't, they weren't enough words. <laughs> um, and then as happens with me apparently is one night I was like, listen, these poems have to come out right now because I have to send them to somebody, <laughs> you know, because it's not just me. And so literally they just went, I sat at my typewriter and one after one, they just, and so I don't know what to say about that, but um, like it, it didn't feel like I made them up at once. It was that they were just kind of like sitting, waiting for the like almost like the the fog or like the the cloggedness of actually doing all the work. Like I couldn't think about anything. I couldn't think about anything else. Like I was thinking about stitches until like the day of the opening, right? And so it was really hard to get it was hard to feel what I was putting in there and like feel the things that I wanted to put in the poems at the same time, like it was kind of confusing. Um, and so I did do most of, almost all the text I work before I did the poems. Um, but the poems were with me while I was doing the text I work. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yes, yeah.
Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, so, kind of like I had said, spoke a little bit about before, is like the the way of like, you know, trying to find ways up through like big clouds of oppression, and um, you know, I I do believe that it won't always be this way. I don't believe it'll be in my lifetime. And I feel okay, I'm, like, I'm at peace with that. Like, I'm like, I, I feel excited to make change even if I'm not necessarily the one that experiences it. Um, and I think I've learned some of that from the people that I um, was kind of like lifting up in, in the quilt. And so, um, so look, one of the people is Alexis Pauline Gums and she's, um, She's a writer and a scholar. She's like a black feminist visionary. Um, and she really grounded and like shifted my experience about thinking about my, how I experienced depression from centering, like centering white supremacy and take it away and centered anti-blackness instead. Um, and when I kind of started to think about race in that way and think about my experience of race that way, um, it was really, um, it was just really powerful and it was really like mm, like making felt like a holistic kind of filling in um, because it's hard to talk back to white supremacy because it's white supremacy and it's so like in everything but there's this way that anti-blackness is so denied like is so um, pocketed in this way that it's like it's like not oh, no, no, that's not anti-blackness, that's X. No, that's anti-blackness. And so, like, kind of really just, like, shifted how I think about, think about a lot of things. And she's one of the people who introduced me to so many black feminist ancestors because it's part of her work. Um, part of her work is, like, is legacy creation, is legacy documenting, is archival work. Um, and she has a, a meditation series that's um, different mantras from 21 black feminists. Um, and she, she says their names um, 108 times because it's uh, the distance between the sun and the earth, or no, the distance between the earth and the moon. Um, and like, it's like, it takes 108 turns or something like that for things to make orbit. Um, and so she breathes those, those words 108 times. Um, and learning about all those different people and the kinds of, like, like the kinds of conversations that were happening now that were happening 200 years ago like and it's like people know this like people like talk about anti-blackness as if it's like oh yeah we know like 500 years but like when you like actually break it down and you're like thinking about it and you're like oh this person like Ida B Wells said the same thing that people are saying now but it's like you know um, it's just really like it's a really grounding thought to be like I'm not having this hard thought for the first time I'm not having to make this like justification of my personhood for the first time, even though it feels like it for the first time, every time. Um, and so yeah, so Alexis is one of those folks. Um, Bree Newsom is one of those folks, and um, she's the woman who climbed and took down the c Confederate flag. Um, oh, I can't remember who else is on there right now. Hmm? Yes, and Miss Major. Um, huh, Miss Major is on there, and um, Miss Major is like, a f like queer, trans, black, grandma of the movement of the like century, um, but also doesn't exist in that idol idolatry way, like is still like a working class, like, you know, like she's like, you know, but she still like exists in the same oppressions that she's fighting against in this way that doesn't always happen when we exalt people. Um, and she's really stays in touch with who she's fighting for, which is really meaningful, and she's just been doing it for a really long ass time, and she's amazing. Um, and when I think about, like, yeah, like queer and trans, non-binary black folks, like, surviving to her age, it's really something I just, like, that's what I need to, like, that's a thing I wanna happen. If I don't make it, then it's like, I need to, like, make sure that people get to, like, be like, Miss Major's like my peer, or like, I got to live as old as Miss Major, or like, whatever, because it's like, we're not, we're not given that as queer and trans, non-binary, brown, black, black, like we're not given that, like that you're gonna get to live until you're like a beautifully grayed, sagging, like creased, soft creature. Um, 
we don't always get that opportunity. And so I feel like I really wanted to hold up, hold her up as someone who's like fought quite hard to get to being um, to being where she is. And that I, yeah, I just want people to know that. <laughs> Um, so she's someone, and Amanda Sternberg is someone too, and I, I kind of wrote about them together in the poem because she's someone who, she's 17 or 18 now, and she's someone who I am like, I didn't have any of that understanding or, or confidence or um, language at that age, which is cool, whatever, it was what it was, but like, um, I appreciate the kind of movements that she's making and the kind of ways that she is using her platform right now to like, um, like speak in between the lines of like common like LGBTQ narratives. Like, I I really appreciate that of hers, and so she was someone that I wanted to lift up. Yeah, and um, yeah, <laughs> people that I've been inspired by for sure. Thanks. Uh, I'm gonna do a time check. Are we okay for time? Yeah. Do you have a question? Yes. Totally, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, everyone, every everything is intentional, I guess. Every stitch is intentional, which is a lot of stitches to think about. Um, quilts are kind of weird. Quilts are weird because um, they can. They there's so many parts of them that can be me that can be meaningful, I guess. Um, and there's parts of there's so many parts of them that don't have to be ascribed with any meaning, um, and so it's it's a decision of being like, okay, well, are people going to read into that or and like also part of the process was knowing that people were going to look at it. Um, that was like a huge thing that I've never really had to like think about before. So being like, oh, is someone going to get that? Don't think about that. Or it's like, should I do it this way? Don't think about that. And like trying to like really like find some balance between that. Um, so pattern-wise, I guess I'll start with uh, running late, which is back corner green. Um, so that one is lots of concentric circles and diagonal lines kind of crisscrossing into each other. Um, and I guess when I'm thinking about the quilt patterns, it's kind of like this, like almost like the subtle vibrational energy like under the message of the quilt. Um, and for that, it was like a lot of like just time clashing, like time like mix, like bumping into each other all the time and kind of feeling like um, I'm never quite, like there's never quite a clearance. It's always like there's kind of like moving dots of like how much capacity I have or like how much time there is or how much I can give. And like there's, there's always this movement. And so I kind of wanted to create this like colliding, um, colliding movement for that one and kind of a crisscross energy because it isn't like, I wake up, this will be my day, I will go back to bed. It is like, it, I, it will change between the time that I wake up and the time that I get up um, as a spoony body. So that's kind of for that one. Um, and then with this, with uh, pain map, um, was anyone, so there was a couple of people that were helping me um, with this one because I was, I was struggling a lot with it because I had wanted to, um, I really wanted to just like show the central nervous system as like a trauma highway <laughs> um, and like and um, the fact that it does a lot of the work in how we and uh, and how we respond and how we heal and, the, and those kinds of things and it is kind of this really biological thing that I don't think we always like think about but like you know, folks that go to therapy and stuff, it's like, you can change your neural pathways if you like, you know, there are ways that we can like learn how to heal from trauma and learn how to like, and, and like be in conversation with our PTSD and stuff like that. And part of that is like 
recognizing that trauma does something top to bottom. Um, and um, the way that this one kind of worked out, um, I just wanted to like have this kind of explosive sort of like dynamic energy coming from the heart because a lot of um, just just hurt. Like I wanted to like it's physical, but there's also so much emotional um, trauma and oppression that goes into the pain that I experience, and like that will like folks with fibromyalgia know. It's like if I get if I get really stressed out, then like I'm gonna it's bad. If I get you know if I get triggered when I'm out, I'm gonna be in a lot of pain, and like that's that. Like that's like something in my heart going, ugh, ugh, I'm not safe. I don't like that, and then everything changes, right? So. That was kind of that one. Um, this one, I wanted, so the, the center um, is just the chart. Like, that's kind of what the chart exists as. Um, but the kind of rays, the diagonal lines on the outside of the frame there, um, I, I just really like thinking about the sky and thinking about sun and thinking about cosmic energy as kind of, just like constantly moving and constantly kind of like flowing and that that's just like a like a brief second of kind of like it's it's kind of who makes me but also it's something everything I can be in relationship with I guess like there's things that I thought were permanent years ago that I thought I couldn't have any relationship with like my pain um, or like my crazy and I feel like now I'm able to like have relationship with that even if it's not necessarily positive even if it's not necessarily healing it's like okay like we're having a dialogue. It's not just this like um, like this hard hurt that I exist with that like just kind of like sits and, and breathes. Um, yeah, so I just kind of wanted to like create like a bit of like sun energy going into that one. Um, for for this one, um, it was kind of the opposite that I wanted sun and energy going out back into the sky. I wanted to start pulling like pulling me into the sky and then leave kind of like sending the energy back out. Um, and then um, with the with the last well not the last one the fourth one um, black matter, um, it's uh, they're prison bars for that one, metaphorically and otherwise. So. Yeah. Prison bars, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, totally. Um, and and I know it's a thing like quilting patterns as a commodity is a thing that I have no idea if I have a relationship to or not. So <laughs> I don't know, but I can't really imagine any of these being appealing to other people, which is fine. I'm quite happy with them. So yeah. Yeah. It was really new. Like it was like I, you know, I've had to, I've had, I've had deadlines before, but I've never had to um, navigate or like mine the the breadth of things that I've had to, and then like present it to somebody on a deadline. Um, and one of the f one of the earlier things that I learned from my mentor um, was that because I was lamenting how long this one was taking me, like it was like. Anyone who follows me on Instagram knows that that one has been like a powerful force in my life for like a year and a half. And like, um, I was really angry. Like, I was just like, why? This isn't, it's taking too long. Like, why is this taking so long? I'm never going to get anything done. And da 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 da. And she was just like, every like stitch, like every hour that that takes is value. Like, every, like, every 20 minutes that you're sitting and do five stitches or whatever, like, that's value the fact that it took you like is taking you like this much time is adding value to the fact that your body is creating this this work um, and so that really helped me think about pace and 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 get into relationship to this might not get done and that's okay that was like 
I had to say that a lot of times, and I was like, this might not get done, and that's okay. It might be one quilt, and that's okay. Um, like, I promised six, it might be one, like, right? And, um, you know, knowing that in other circumstances, if, you know, there was like, you know, an emergency, like a medical emergency, or like things that are like um, conventionally understood as like blockers of productivity, <laughs> um, then people would be like, oh, it's okay, that person's so and so, such and such, so it's fine, but if it was like, oh, that person was just tired, like, it's, it's different, right? Um, and so, um, yeah, and so it was like really hard oftentimes, um, and I got really angry, um, like, with time <laughs> and with, like, having to explain anything. Like, I got really irritated. I got really irritated. Like, I got really irritable um, because I was like, I felt like I was like, you get, don't you get my body? Like, why don't you stop asking me? Like, don't you, like, it was just like, this is my body, but you get my body because you want this art, but you don't get my body because you have a timeline, but you do because you're kind of flexible about it, but you don't because it has to happen at this time. And it was just this kind of like, like, how much do I have to like continually um, explain the way that I work um, in order to like get time to work for me? Um, that, so that was hard. That was just like something I had to like um, be with. I do a lot of like lists and like and calendars and um, and and like that kind of scheduling. And so it was like when I started, ooh, the list like the clean ass timeline that I had for January. This one's gonna get done. You're gonna write the poem. February. This one's gonna get done. You're gonna write the poem. It's gonna be so good. May. You're gonna be done. You're gonna go on vacation. It's gonna be great. And I was like, this is all the time. And like, it's all worked out. And my mind knows that this probably won't happen. But there's still this like idea that like, okay, I, someone I can show this piece of paper to someone that I tried really hard and that like this is you know what I worked for. Um, and it, for me anyway, um, I'm a deadline worker. I've learned that about myself, that I work so great, real close to that deadline. Um, and a couple, you know, a few years of kind of like being in this, in that rhythm has given me like an idea of what to do with it now. So it's like before it'd be like, oh shit. Like it wouldn't be like, surprise, it's due tomorrow. It'd be like, think, 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 imagine, imagine, dream, dream, dream. Think, 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 do tomorrow. And then it would just, um, which is maybe not the like most effective way to do things, um, but I guess I think that yeah, the biggest thing was was being was reckoning with myself um, the like that this wasn't the only opportunity. Also, that this wasn't the only life that these things would have. Um, and so if I didn't finish this one or this one or this one, I could finish it and it would have another life. And so like really thinking, um, thinking big picture and thinking about like, I do a lot of thinking, like thinking about like who the deadline was for and then like, and like, okay, it's actually important because of access and like this way. And so like, okay, what can I like offer at this time to make it work for every, all the parties cons um, involved? Um, the biggest thing that was hard about time was how many delays there were in me getting started. Like there was like a lot of hiccups to me actually being able to like be in the studio in a place that wasn't shifting, that had access with an elevator that was working, technically not, but you know, it was accessible to me. Um, and that wasn't the case for a, a large part of my residency, that there was like a lot of hiccups with locations and access and elevators breaking for six weeks and that kind of thing and having to move around. And, um, and so there was like, a lot of um, jostling to how, because for me it really helps to be able to like imagine myself in a situation. So like imagine myself in this space doing this. Okay, I can sit in that chair for this long, or like I can bring this many snacks, or it's this far away from home. Like I really have to do a lot of like, you know, like little planning and things like that, which I think comes from, well, it comes from a lot of things, but um, PTSD is one of them. <laughs> Just like making sure that things are, I'm not going to be surprised um, when I have to go into the feelings of this work, right? Um, but it took a long time to get there, and so that was also hard to be like, okay, you have a deadline, and I have this deadline, but I can't start yet, and so I'm just gonna hope that it's gonna 
I just had to hope that it was going to happen in the time that I had. Um, I think the thing I was saying about community too is like not doing it by myself. Like I did a lot of it obviously by myself. I did all of it mostly by myself, but like having someone else accountable to a deadline for you is huge. Like having someone else be like, hey, so um, I think that, that grant's due in a couple of days. How are you feeling about it? Like really shifted things. And so I, I was actually working with someone for the past six months who I was kind of like, who was coaching me in like time stuff. And so for that, I was like, we'd, we'd meet and then she'd be like, okay, in two weeks, how many, like, what do you want to get done? And I'd be like, okay, I want to get the top piece of this done um, and I want to have half of that drafted. And then I would like have that little thing and it was just for her or just for me, but it really, really helped. And so like that was one thing that like, even though my capacities varied, if I would figure out in those two weeks how to meet that tiny task and that was a huge, huge thing. Having someone else accountable, huge. Yeah. And if there are any more questions, I'm happy to answer them. I can, I don't know how we are for time. I can't, 15 minutes? Okay, any like, oh, I just really wanna know this really awkward, embarrassing thing, but I don't know how to ask them. If I won't, if I don't wanna answer it, I just won't, but you can ask me. Um, let's see. Let me think about something interesting to share with you while you think about questions. Mm -hmm. So many brilliant people that make me happy. That's a thing, that's true, is that poems, poetry is tough. <laughs> like poetry, being like, I'm gonna be a poet, hey, dad, or I'm gonna be a poet. Um, not even a novelist, I'm not even gonna be a novelist, I'm gonna be a poet. Um, and it's like, it's really solitary, it's really weird and like ugly and there's, you know, it can be really just unpleasant to to want to let someone in because it can be just like really like emotional work. Um, and so like being able to communicate that um, this like weird poetic textile thing was happening and that I was really scared about it and that I was really excited about it and that I really wanted people to show up and that I was like, have you ever done this thing? And I was just like really, like was able to be like, universe, I'm doing this. Universe, I'm doing this. Universe, um, you got me, right? And sometimes I didn't feel that way, but like the fact that um, I did feel like even if it's just these six poems that I ever write for the rest of my life, like the fact that people wanted to experience them um, and that I got to share them, um, made the whole like, hey dad, I'm gonna be a poet, kinda feel a little bit softer and a little bit nicer. Um, yes. yes, yes. I have a, um, a question. I, um, I normally uh, take in a very uh, uh, metaphysical approach to each. Uh, you've spoke love and a lot into your uh, pieces a whole lot. Um, what do you do afterwards for when the show is done? Totally, totally. Um, I had to really prepare myself to not have them anymore. Um, like, I had to really be like, okay, you're not, they're not gonna be at the studio when you go back there tomorrow. Like, or like, you're not gonna like, wake up and get to touch that thing or whatever. And so I had to do kind of like a lot of coaching to be like, you're gonna have to leave them in a room with like alone overnight. And um, <laughs> that was really, it was hard, but then I was able to, be prepared for that. And so I was able to do some ritual and like I say goodnight to them when I leave and I say hi to them when I come back. And um, I feel like, so when I was, when I was working in the studio, um, I kind of like opened and closed with a prayer. Um, and especially when I was working on ancestor pieces, I was like, I just need someone to know that I'm doing this right now. Like, um, and that really helped um, like remember the heart of, of why I wanted to do things, even if it was like feeling like deadline or like, oh, this material isn't working or whatever. Like it was like, I was able to be like, okay, like I was witnessed by my ancestors or by spirits or whoever was like with me for that session. Um, and so that kind of like helped them feel quite cared for by the time 
they were done by the time I kind of like had to leave them. And so um, like I feel like they're pretty like protected um, now, which I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> yeah, Mary. Great. Okay. Thank you. It's a really cool question. Um, um, I really had to think about my pain in a new way, I guess, to do this work and just to especially work on pain map to start to like unpack where like my first trying to find my first memory of pain um, was really intense. Like it was a really intense experience and a really intense process to kind of get to. Um, but there's something, yeah, there's just something about having, like, had to, like, experience my body in the ways that it is to touch everything, to, like, touch every piece, um, to really, like, negotiate, not even negotiate, but just, like, conversate with different pain bits of myself, and, and, like, so I grew up, I grew up with my mom being dead, and so that was, like, it's a thing that you say when you're a kid. It's just like a thing that, oh, like, do you have brothers and sisters? Nope. And like, who's your mom and dad? Oh, I don't have a mom. And it's like a conversation that you have a lot. And so it was like this pain that was really routine or like that was very like, very like, mm, like, what's it, like muted, muted in its, in its emotion because of people don't, when you're, especially when you're a kid, people are like, I do not know what to do with all the shit that you just told me about your life. Like, even if it's that one thing, people are like really uncomfortable with it. And so I feel like I've had a long relationship of like being aware of how my pain affects other people. Um, and I think that was something I was conscious of in, in doing the work and being like, okay, I'm gonna like express as much as I can the different kinds of pain that I talk about, that I live with, that I've experienced, that I grew up with, that I see. Um, but like being like, um, being an empathic person and being someone who's had to carry and like, and like softly frame some really hard things about my own life for other people to like be okay with, um, I really didn't want to do that here. Like I didn't want to like be like, here's, here's a kitten first. Um, a little bit of trauma here, that puppy, <laughs> and um, this, there's a little, that scar happened, and, and because I don't, I don't get to experience it that way, like, I don't get to, like, have a break, I don't get to, like, have a kitten when I, you know, when someone dies, I don't get to, like, um, whatever, and, and um, it really, really feels like, I can't even express it another way, but, like, if you were to, if I was, like, if you just went like this, and, like, those geodes or whatever, like, this, if you put it all back together, it would, I would turn into this kind of thing. Um, and yeah, I don't know if that speaks to your question enough. Yeah? Okay. I can say more later if you want. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's just weird being, it's weird, and people who experience in this, it's really weird to be in pain all the time. Like, I don't know if you're someone that doesn't experience chronic pain, it's so hard people to understand that you're like actually in pain all the time. Like even doctors that know what it is, they're like, so all the time? And I'm like, you, you gave me the diagnosis, so it'd be really cool if you could like remember what it was, that it's actually all the time. And so like this one Tylenol that you're gonna give me for the next six months is probably not gonna do much because it's chronic, which you told me. <laughs> so, you know, and, and it's, an, it's like 
it's whatever, it's my life, it's my reality, it's the reality of many people in my life, but it's also like this thing that people just don't get, and it's really annoying that people don't get it sometimes. Like, it's like, well, this, is this gonna hurt you? And I'm like, I don't know, because I'm in pain all the time. <laughs> so it's a negotiation, and so it's like also true, like with the spoons thing, it's like getting people in your life to witness that it's not about being in pain and not being in pain. It's like, like, how can I meet you at this pain level? Or how can I like get, you know, how am I gonna see you in this moment? And I'm not gonna try to like make you feel better because it's actually not possible because you have chronic pain. Um, and it's scary because people don't like seeing people that they care for upset or in pain or, you know, people don't like seeing people that are under 60 with canes. They have a lot of opinions about it. They have a lot of opinions about people that are not seniors in their age times with canes. They're like, I have so many questions about your body, about your experience, your age, your medical history. Do you have like a, do you have like a file that I could like read about your medical history just to prove if you actually need this? Because you probably don't need it because you're really young. Um, and, and that kind of thing too of like, okay, well my pain is making you super uncomfortable, but like the fact that I have this thing that makes it easier, that makes it like, able for me to like interact with the world more makes it even more uncomfortable than me being in pain and so you'd rather me not have it. Um, and so I'm just kind of like also like asking people to think about that and to like don't, don't question someone when they tell you where they're at. Like don't question someone when they offer you something of themselves because it doesn't quite match up with even if you know them so super well. Like um, it it does nothing for your relationship. It does nothing for that person's like validity in their personhood. Um, and one of the huge things that are as hard about finding a personhood is when it's not being, it's not being mirrored back at you. Like if you're like, here I am, no, you're this. Here I am, no, you're this. It's like being misgendered. It's like, like, here I am, here I am, but mm, I don't really like these people around here don't really get that. So I'm just like not going to engage with that part of you because I don't get it. Um, being in pain is a part of like how I actually exist. Like it's not an option not to have. And so it's something that like I've had to, again, become in relationship to. Um, and it's a big ask on the people in my life to be like, can you be in relationship with this too? Like what, what, it's, what it's gonna be like for us to be in community together or for us to be family is for you to be in relationship to my pain because like otherwise I'm explaining to you all the time or I'm putting myself in danger to make you more comfortable. Um, and it's hard to be, f it's hard to offer that because maybe you don't want to, maybe it's like you don't like that person that much or maybe you know, you don't know how to give that of yourself and that's actually completely valid. It's like actually completely fine if you can't support someone, just tell them that. And like, you know, I've been in a lot of situations where it's like I've needed a lot of help or I need a lot of support and um, you know, care relationships is a whole other kind of conversation but um, I think a huge part of, I guess like a message that I wanna, share is like, so back to my mom, um, part of the reason that my mom's death is so hard is because of how her, my grief was shaped and how my grief was responded to by my dad um, and how it was ignored and how like it wasn't, um, it wasn't um, presenced that this person lost this person and that was gonna be something that happened for the rest of their life. And so I didn't get to grieve. Um, and so it was this relationship of being like, I have this sad feeling, you don't have that sad feeling. I have this question, you don't have that question. Um, and what that does, what, what, why it hurts so much in this life that I have now, the grief of the death of my mother is because of how invisibilized and how fucking awful it was to like be like, I'm hurting so much and no one cares. Like no one actually seems to be aware that this is, kind of destroying this kid. Um, whereas like, I've, you know, I've lived with many other people in my life who've lost their moms and who've lost their moms at the same ages and who get told stories and get told mysteries and all those kinds of things and you get to have a relationship with that. And so it makes the pain different. It doesn't make it less, it makes it different. And so had my pain, my physical pain, um, you know, have, and not just myself, but other folks in the room too, it's like if we didn't have to mm, make so much noise for us to, for you to witness my pain, then I wouldn't always be like having to like do stuff with my body to be like, I'm actually, like I really need you to pay attention to this. I need you to witness this because when, every time that you don't, like I don't know what to do with it. I'm not, I don't get to be me anymore. And so every time that you tell me that I'm not grieving or every time you tell me that it's not in pain in whatever way that is, if that's like, if that's asking you to do activity that you know I cannot do 
and making me make that decision, even though you know I can't do it. Oh, we're all gonna go on this really cool like hike. Um, let's go on a hike, and um, it's gonna be so beautiful. And like you know, we're gonna do this thing. And I'm like, that sounds really beautiful. I'm gonna have to like ask you to accommodate me because you haven't actually like spoken to the fact that you understand my pain because you're not in relationship to my pain. Um, and I think um, it's yeah, it's just like a scary thing to um, make friends with. Um, but like not having the option of a lot of the relationships that I have, including trauma and anti-blackness and um, all the things, like it's um, a request that you be here with me on those things. And like that's like, you know, Ally 101, which is like a whole other thing, but um, it's not just like getting that you might need a chair sometimes, or that I might need a chair sometimes. It's like, um, I don't want to be the only one carrying, carrying this all the time, right? Um, and I don't want it just to have to be a romantic partner. I don't want to have to just be my therapist or something like that. And like that's, I would love to see a community where we're doing that collectively. And it's like we're actually like, like in relationship to each other's experiences, um, because I feel like it kind of like, like our empathy. Um, when we do that, so I think I think that's all. I don't know. <laughs> Are there any last questions? I don't think any more poems. Oh, I always have poems, but I don't think I have any more for today. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>